Let's turn to the blue hardcover hymnal and our opening hymn number 745, 745. Hark the voice of Jesus crying. stand. We remember the holy name spoken over us at our baptism when we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 1, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Let's confess our sins to the Lord. The congregation may kneel. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. 
trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being, of the church of God and for the unity of all let us pray to the Lord for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise let us pray to the Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. you let us pray O oh Lord you granted your prophets strength to resist the temptations of the devil and courage to proclaim repentance give us pure hearts and minds to follow your son faithfully even into suffering and death through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first Bible reading this morning is going to be found in your pew Bible, page 905. It's from the writings of a 
one of God's prophets, the prophet Amos. Amos chapter 7 is a, is a very striking chapter because it starts out with God saying, here's what my people deserve. And Amos says, no, Lord, not that. Okay. <laughs> here's what my people deserve. And Amos says, no, Lord, not that. Okay. <laughs> and so we have Amos again and again standing between God and his sinful people and saying, God, no, 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 don't punish him. And now here, right after that, is one of the leaders of those sinful people saying, get out of here, Amos. <laughs> Chasing away the one man huh, who's standing between God's judgment and these people. And, and Amos says, hey, I didn't choose this job for myself. Let's hear from Amos chapter 7, starting with verse 10. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel, Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile, away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there, and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Our psalm today is in the blue hardcover hymnal, page 818, Psalm 62.
Our second reading is on page 1219. 1219 in the Pew Bible. Paul writes to the young pastor Titus, and one of Titus's jobs was to raise up the next generation of church leaders. And Paul says, here's the kind of man that you need. Titus chapter 1, starting with verse 5. The reason I left you in Crete was that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join me in the Alleluias. The Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self discipline. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Our Holy Gospel and our sermon text this morning is page 1008 in your pew Bible from St. Mark's account of the ministry of Jesus, chapter 6, starting at verse 7. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. The gospel of our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our hymn of the day is in the blue hardcover hymnal, page 716. O Christ, who called the twelve. Before we jump into that, if you haven't already, there's a blue, little blue binder uh, toward the center aisle in your pew. It says Friendship Register on it. If you haven't filled that out yet, could you grab that? Fill that out, everybody. And those of you who are coming up to the Lord's Supper later today, could you mark that in there too, please? Thank you. In your bulletin, I'll point out uh, this insert here has an outline of a message today, if that's something you want to use to help you follow along. And on the back is a tear-off part uh, where you can turn in your prayer requests or sign up for uh, volunteering. We'll, we'll talk more about that after the message. 
All right, again, our hymn of the day, Blue Hymnal 716. My dear Garden Homes family, we take a little detour from our verses about Jesus sending out the disciples to send them out with nothing. And look at one other verse that I think those, those words of Jesus, take nothing with you, are such a cool demonstration of this other verse, I think is a, a favorite of many of us, huh? A cool demonstration of seek first. Do you remember that verse? Matthew 6, verse 33, Jesus is talking about worrying. huh? Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry about keeping yourself alive. Unbelievers are running after all those things. But you, he says, you seek first God's priorities. And God will make sure you have all the other stuff. huh? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things you're worried about will be given to you. Such a tremendous promise. 
This is what you got to chase after. This has to be number one in your life. Get this. No matter what else falls to the side, and God will take care of you. And, and just look at, at, at what he wants us to put first. Huh? He says, seek first God's kingdom, that, that, that God would take charge with his king power, that God would take charge of your life, your neighbor's life, the circumstances around you. Seek that so that sin won't be in charge and pain and fear won't be in charge and division and hate won't be in charge and need and poverty and want won't be in charge. But God can take charge of your life and the people's lives around you. Seek that. Number one, do whatever you can to make that happen. And seek his kingdom, seek his, his righteousness. There, where Jesus says those words at the end of, of Matthew chapter 6, he's just been talking throughout Matthew 5 and 6 in the Sermon on the Mount what God's righteousness is like, how it isn't like the hypocrite's righteousness, huh? the righteousness of fake, empty religion. Oh, no. And he says things like, this righteousness, you got to hunger for it. you got to thirst for it. For this kind of righteousness, and what's it like? He describes it, doesn't he, there in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the kind of righteousness where you control your temper, and you control your mouth, and you control your eyes, and you stick up to your marriage vows, and you stick up for your neighbor, and you love your enemy, and you give to whoever is in need. That kind of righteousness. Seek that first, huh? Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Ooh. So instead of avoiding conflict, you go into it and try to fix it. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. So instead of walking past the desperate and the lonely, you show them mercy. You help. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> so instead of ignoring the brokenhearted, you sit down and cry with them. That's God's kind of righteousness. There's nothing empty, nothing fake about it. And Jesus says, you seek that first and let God take care of the rest. Let God take care of your, your, your food. huh? He'll, it will be given to you. Let God take care of your clothes. It will be given to you. And maybe he'll even give you clothes with food on it. Who knows? <laughs> That's what you've got to seek. And Jesus, he sends his disciples out just like that, doesn't he? What a cool demonstration of this promise. Don't take anything with you, he says. Don't take any food, any extra clothes, any money. You do the work I'm giving you to do, and I'll take care of all that other stuff. Seek first, and God will provide. You ever play hide and seek recently? A lot of times when you're done counting, if you're the seeker, what do you say? You say, ready or not, here I come. And you're warning the people, finish your hiding, right? Put the finishing touches, get that last pillow over your head or whatever. Because <laughs> it wouldn't be fun if I find you right away. Uh, but, but the disciples of Jesus, they say, ready or not, here I come. I'm talking about myself. Even if I feel I have nothing, <laughs> if, I, if I meet none of the requirements for the work you are giving me to do, Jesus, <laughs> here I come, sent out with nothing. That kind of faith, that kind of ready or not, here I come faith, huh? That's what Jesus wants to work in our hearts as he puts in front of us the sending out of these 12 disciples with nothing. And to walk our way through that, uh, we're going to take the, our verses kind of in backwards order. You could look at uh, Mark chapter 6, verses 7 through 13 with the outline. It's talking first, we see Jesus' authority and then his instructions. And then we see them out on the mission. So we get to see what the mission of Jesus actually is. But let's take those, let's take those in reverse order. Huh? First, his mission. What is the mission of Jesus? What do those disciples go out and do when they take nothing with them? It doesn't have to be that complicated, does it? Huh? The mission was fixing lives. Fixing lives. <laughs> Look at verses 12 and 13 of Mark chapter 6, and it says they, they went out preaching that people should repent. 
Repent means what? Turn away from sin. Turn back to God. So people's lives were broken with sin, and they came in to fix them. Here, come on. Let's get that sin out of, out of your life. And what else did they do? They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So people who were having trouble with hell, people who were having trouble with their health, they came and fixed it. Fixing lives. People who, who couldn't stop sinning, didn't even know what their sins were. People who had trouble with sin, they came and fixed it. Huh? People who had trouble with the, the, the power of hell, the dirtiness and filth and influence of hell and the demons in their lives. And, and, and the disciples came and said, let's get, it, let's get rid of that. Let's clean that out. Let's send it away. People, people suffering, people with pain, with sickness, with disability, with injury. And the disciples said here, let's... Let's give you relief. Fixing lives. That's, that's the mission. That's Jesus. That's what we see Jesus doing all the time, isn't it? As he walks this earth. Fixing lives. Oh, and that is such an important, vital mission. This fixing lives for Jesus mission is so important, Jesus says. That if any town doesn't want you, hmm, they're in big trouble. Any town that wouldn't want men like that coming in their town to fix life after life after broken down, tragic filled life, huh? what kind of town is that? Huh? Locking your doors against that, shutting your ears against that, closing off your heart against the power of Jesus, that life repairing, soul restoring power of Jesus. Oh boy, you're asking for trouble, Jesus says, and that's, that's where the dust comes in, huh? You hear how Jesus talks about the dust in, uh, in, in verse 11. He says, if any, any place does not welcome you or receive you, shake the dust off your feet as you leave as a testimony against them. In other words, you got to let them know. you got to warn them. you got to give them a testimony. They can see with their eyes and the dust from their dirt roads that's on your feet. You shake it off right in front of them to say, we don't even want to take your dust with us, you people, because you are bringing such a guilt upon yourselves by rejecting what we are bringing you in the name of Jesus. And we don't want God on judgment to say, oh, you with them? I see you got some of the dirt from their road on your feet. No, we don't even want that. We don't want even a smidgen of the punishment that you're bringing on yourselves. Wow, what an important mission. What a beautiful mission. Fixing lives for Jesus. Where are you supposed to go on that mission? Huh? Where should you be going? What, uh, <laughs> what, Lives is Jesus lining up for you to fix. People who, who are stuck in sin, for you to help get out of it. People who are in the devil's trap, for you to help escape. People who are in pain or suffering, for you to bring comfort to, relief to. It's not just Jesus' mission. It's not just the 12 disciples' mission. It's, it's still the mission for you and for me. Do you notice those people around you? you have time for them to go to them? It's Jesus' mission, fixing lives. But, but really, in our verses, and it's almost surprising, isn't it, that Jesus spends more time on his instructions. And his instructions aren't that complicated either. <laughs> Take nothing with you. Going on a big trip, we, we got to go on vacation uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, my wife takes care of that, thankfully, but she makes out a list for herself what to pack. She makes out a list for the, the kids. Here's what you pack, how many pairs of underwear and all your swimming suits, all that stuff. And then, uh, of course, oftentimes you get two blocks away from the house, and then there's that, did I remember, <laughs> kind of a thing. Uh, but Jesus packing list for the disciples is is like that, huh? 
There's nothing on it. Take nothing, he says. Don't take any bread. Don't take a bag. Why not? Because you don't need to worry about food. And you don't need to worry about stuff. Don't take any money in your belt because you don't need to worry about buying things or paying your bills. Don't, d don't, uh, don't bring an extra shirt because you don't have to worry about smelling good or looking clean. And whatever house takes you in, you stay there till you're done in that town. Because you don't have to worry about whether they got a nice bed for you or whether they're poor or whether their house is crowded or whether they know how to keep their kids quiet or whether you're going to get any sleep at night. You don't need to worry about any of that. Take nothing. Because why? Because for one thing, <laughs> the, the mission of Jesus of fixing lives bringing people to repentance, bringing people to God, bringing people relief is lots more important than your hungry belly and it's lots more important than, than smelling good and not having B.O. and not having food stains on your clothes or, or holes in you. It's more important than, than money or anything that money can buy. It's lots more important than your privacy and your comfort and uh, staying away from annoying people with noisy, slobbery kids. It's more important than any of that. And, and what? Jesus is promising he will provide. You seek first, bringing people God's kingdom, making things right the way God wants them to be right, and all the things you worried about will be given to you. That's a promise. <laughs> I'll make sure somebody feeds you. I'll make sure somebody does your laundry once in a while. I will make sure that even if you don't get the most comfortable <laughs> and the most well-off uh, house in town to host you, you will still be well taken care of. You can leave your MasterCard at home. I'll take care of it. Psalm 34, verse 10. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And, and it wasn't just these physical things that the disciples didn't have, but something that surprises me again and again when I look at where this is in the story of Jesus in Mark chapter 6. It's a couple chapters yet before Jesus actually tells them, you know, guys, what I'm really here for is to die on a cross to pay for your sins. They don't know that yet. And you know what I'm going to do after that? Three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead to conquer the grave for the whole human race. They don't know that either. So these, these most important things about why Jesus was down here on earth, right? These things that... Preachers try to put into every single sermon. The disciples don't even know these things. And Jesus sends them out. Hey, go preach for me. How much they didn't know. But, but God's going to provide for that too. I will use your incomplete, ignorant testimony about me to bring people out of their sins and out of their suffering and out from under the paw of Satan and bring them back to God. And he did. In town after town after town. So now you look at yourself. I don't know who God is sending you to, who God wants you to help out of their sins, out of their troubles with the devil, or their, give them comfort in their pains. I don't know what lonely, broken heart God is sending you to, but however unqualified you feel, however much you feel you lack the basic requirements to go and help that person, or you feel ignorant of the Word of God, how can I share my faith with this person? Mm. ready or not here I come huh? you take nothing with you Jesus says go then go and let him take care of what you are lacking let him take care of your nothing what a powerful message what a call to faith was that intimidating for the disciples to step out like that on their first missionary journey? might very well have been but they went. 
but they went. You can count on God to be there for you because, because first of all, whatever he's sending you to do to help this other person is more important than whatever you're worried about. And secondly, he promises to provide. And there, there, was, uh, there was one thing that he said they could take along, a staff. I don't know what, what for. Maybe in case the dogs came by to chase the dogs away. Uh, and something else they could take along. And that was each other. He sent them out two by two. And so I just want to pause here and just think about what these verses say about our time in church. Huh? He sent them out two by two. In other words, there's strength in numbers. There's strength in Christian friendship. So go ahead and find that here. He sent them out two by two. In other words, maybe somebody here needs you to be there too. <laughs> Because they got somebody, they're supposed to be helping, they're supposed to be fixing, they're supposed to be calling to repentance, and they need you for encouragement. They need you to say how, you know, I'm really afraid, and then just to listen to them. They need you to pray with them or go side by side. Somebody here today might need you to be their number two, huh? And then what else is happening here on church? Just like the people in all those towns had the opportunity to support God's workers, so you have opportunity here to support God's workers. What else happens here in church? Here in church, you get your power. You get your authority to call sinners back to God. To take people out from the power of the devil. To get the devil out of your neighborhood, out of your family here at church. You get power to keep going back to those hurting people and hurting right along with them. And what else? Here in church. Here in church, we need to keep our eyes not just on the budget, not just on whether the building's going to stand, not on our shortcomings, not on our fears for our congregation, but on the mission on the people that God has put all around us to help and to bring healing to and to bring Jesus to and let God worry about all those other things. Most of the time is that our attitude, sometimes we forget here at Garden Homes, isn't it? All right, we looked at his mission, we looked at his instructions, and let's uh, finish up by looking at his Authority. I don't know if it looks like that. Jesus slammed Duncan on the devil. Or maybe it looks more like this. But uh, we see Jesus' authority in verse 7. Mark chapter 6, verse 7. Not just authority to send preachers out with a new message. Huh? That's a huge authority. But also, he gives these 12 men power to drive out demons. He has such power over the devil, over all the forces of evil in hell, that he didn't just have it in himself. He can hand it out to whom he pleases. And this is even before his victory. Oh, we know Jesus had victory over the devil. Good Friday at the cross when he took away the devil's sin power and got us all forgiveness. We know Jesus had a victory Easter morning at the empty tomb when he took away the devil's death power and gave us eternal life. Huh? But this is, this is more than a year before those victories. And here already Jesus has power, unstoppable, irrefutable power against all the devils of hell. Because why? Because he's God's son. Because he is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Because he is the Holy One. And the demons tremble at his name. Yes, and he gives that kind of power to these 12 ignorant, sinful men. Such as Jesus' authority. You think he has authority to keep the devil out of your way? And get them out of your community? As long as we're looking ahead to Good Friday and Easter, think about this. Huh? How Jesus set his authority aside. Monday, Thursday night, Jesus could have driven that devil right out of Judas' heart. <laughs> but he didn't. 
And he didn't chase the, de the devils out of the hearts of the Sanhedrin and the chief priests who were plotting to murder him and rigging his court trials. And he didn't drive the demons out of the crowd that was stirring them up to shout, crucify him, crucify him. No, he let the devil put him on a cross. He let the devil bury him in a tomb so that so he could save you. That's a lot of love. That's a lot of love. With all that power, with all that love, with all that victory, what are we waiting for? Ready or not? Here I come. Because we can step out with nothing. We can go forth with nothing when we know that Jesus is enough. My God will meet all your needs. My God is able to pour all grace into your life so that in every situation you have everything you need to do every good work. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. So you can look at yourself and say, Oh, I got nothing. I am nothing. What do I have to offer the world? I can hardly keep track of my own mess, much less fix other people's mess. And as far as knowledge of Jesus, that I should go around helping other people out of their sins? What? <laughs> How could Jesus use me? Shush! Shush! Jesus says to these 12 ignorant, sinful men, You take nothing with you. Go. And he says that to his church still today. Jesus is enough. No matter how much like a nothing you feel, no matter how empty your head is, your heart is, your mouth is, your wallet is, what does that matter? Jesus is enough for every nothing. Jesus is enough to meet every need. He's enough to use even you. He is enough to fix every life. Amen? Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's practice. Talking about our God, we use the old, old words of the Nicene Creed, pages 7 and 8 in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Two special prayers this morning. Let's pray for our country after the news last night.
Please stand for the close of our service. I got uh, three more prayers, if we can uh, put them in at this point of the service. Uh, Margie and Marie have requested a prayer for their niece, uh, Azraya. Did I say that right? Azraya? Ro Azira? Thank you. Azira Robinson. She was just diagnosed with thyroid cancer and uh, will be going through radiation this week. Uh, we also give a prayer of thanks for CL and Nicole Whiteside. A couple Saturdays ago, they uh, had their first child, a little baby girl, Addison Nicole Whiteside. So we thank God for that. And then uh, maybe you met him already, but our new eighth grade teacher uh, is here in the building today, Mr. Nate Brown. So just a little prayer as he uh, gets his feet wet here at Garden Homes. All right, so I'll put all those in after the post-communion prayer. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup. O oh God, the Father, source of all goodness, in Your loving kindness You sent Your Son to share our humanity. We thank you that through him you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We also pray that you will not forsake us, but will rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, so that we willingly serve you day after day. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord God, we lift up into your hands and commend into your care the niece of Margie and Marie Azira Robinson. Comfort her heart after her cancer diagnosis and let her radiation treatments this week be a blessing to her and bring healing and not much pain. We thank you for protecting Nicole Whiteside as she gave birth to a, her beautiful, healthy daughter, Addison. Protect mother and daughter in this fragile time and bring them soon here to your house uh, for holy baptism. And we thank you for our new eighth grade teacher, Mr. Nate Brown. Thank you for him being here in worship with us today. Help us to be a blessing to him and give him uh, clarity and, uh, and all the wisdom he needs as he prepares for his first day of school in a little more than a month. All this we ask in the name of our Savior Jesus, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We turn to the blue paperback songbook, page 114, for a closing hymn.
Please be seated. I rejoice with those who said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. It's really a joy to uh, be with you here today. Thank you. Uh, August 18th, August 18th, a little more than a month from today, is our Family of Faith Sunday. Hearts Aglow ladies will be hosting this year's events. They are still seeking volunteers to help with serving, decorations, picking up groceries, grilling, hosting games, setting up, taking down. You can speak to any of, of the Hearts Aglow ladies or sign up on the uh, tear-off thing and hand it to me on your way out. Uh, if you'd like to make a food item donation, you can also contact Mrs. Lowry. She's the president of Hearts of Glow, 414-449-3705, 449-3705. We have Bible class this morning looking at uh, the name of the Lord and what a safe refuge that is for God's people. So uh, it's going to be an a encouraging time if you want to join us in the cafeteria in about 10 minutes. Any other announcements today? Mr. Brown, can you, can you wave? Nate Brown, there, there he is. If you can introduce yourself to him today, our new 8th grade teacher. Oh, we got our women's praise and worship Wednesday at 6. If you don't know what that is about, Diane, who, who blessed us with our communion song today, uh, she's the host of that, and you can talk to her and get more info. That's Wednesday at 6. Anybody else? God is good. All the time.
Second.